Good afternoon, uh, Paul. Good morning, Daniel. For you, it's very early morning. Uh, good afternoon to, to everyone and very welcome to the first uh, SEPS webinar on coronavirus. Uh, today is the 26th March. We are about two months after the, the first corona uh, case was uh, identified in Italy. And by now, basically, almost the entire continent is locked down and almost all EU citizens are confined at home. We are all home. We are all showing <laughs> our homes. Um, and uh, I think this is, uh, this is really an unprecedented uh, situation. Um, many have compared it with, uh, with a wall uh, where actually the, the enemy is, uh, is not visible. The virus is really propagating very fast and there is having huge impact on um, health, on uh, people, on society, on, on the economy. And this is basically the reason why we have decided to, to start a series of uh, webinars. Uh, this is only the, the first one, uh, focusing on specific topics, specific aspects. Um, let me just say that this is a part of what SEPS has been doing for, for many years. It's really inherent to, to our work, trying to contribute uh, to understanding events and uh, policy response and impact of, uh, of such events and policy response. And we are uh, determined to, to continue to, to do so. So in this sense, we, we read our role even with more uh, emphasis in uh, this uh, situation. It's clear that there is a need to, for policymakers, for EU institutions, uh, for companies to understand what is happening and what uh, can be done. So it is really in, in this uh, um, reading of, of the situation that uh, uh, today we will start uh, um, uh, to discuss uh, the first one of the first aspects, which is the economic uh, related to the economic impact of coronavirus. Um, and for this uh, discussion, uh, I'm, I'm glad to to have uh, Paul De Grove, who is professor professor at uh, uh, LSE, uh, and also um, SEPS associate fellow, senior associate fellow. And then Daniel Gross, our director, who is currently in, um, in, on sabbatical, is visiting a Berkeley University uh, in California. That's why it's, I think it's five in the morning for you, <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I'm really glad to, to start uh, this discussion. Maybe before I move to, to a brief introduction to, um, of the topic and to, to, to leave the floor to the speakers, um, a message of maybe some instructions for the participants. Um, we would very much like to receive questions which uh, we can discuss. So um, since you cannot speak because everyone is, is muted, that's the only way we can manage 172 participants. So this is the number of people uh, connected. Um, I would still invite you to, um, to ask questions. And in order to do this, um, please just uh, um, uh, click uh, the Q&A button that you will find on the, on the black bar um, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, please don't use the, the chat because otherwise it, it makes it very difficult for us to, uh, to keep track of, of questions. Uh, but feel free to, uh, to ask questions, uh, to write questions at, at any time. Now for the topic. Um, last week, the, the ECB announced uh, a 750 billion pandemic emergency uh, purchase program, um, announcing that these purchases uh, will last an, at least until the end of uh, 2020. They will include all the categories which were already eligible uh, under the existing asset purchase program. And uh, in fact, the eligibility criteria have been uh, relaxed uh, very much so that the ECB can actually buy uh, many different kinds of, uh, of assets. Now, one of the key questions is, uh, is that sufficient in order to, uh, to mitigate, if you want, or to contain uh, the impact of the crisis on, uh, on the economy? And um, I would like to start with this question and uh, ask to, to Paul to, to share with us his thoughts. Paul, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, first uh, um, teleconference, or uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's, I'm very pleased uh, to be with you and to be able to um, tell you my story, the way I see um, we should deal <coughs> with this uh, problem that uh, has uh, come up so suddenly and, and, and create such a crisis in, in, in the world and, and in Europe. <coughs> 
So everybody, I guess, knows the, the ingredients of the, of the economic implications. I, I'm not going to talk about the, 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 the other dimension, which is probably even more important and has to do with the health and, and of so many people. But the economic implications of all this um, can be characterized as follows. Uh, it, it, you can see it as a supply and demand shock that interact with each other, right? And that uh, can uh, lead to a deflationary spiral that brings down the economy. And the ingredients of that spiral are that companies that suddenly have to stop producing are threatened by failure, unemployment shoots up, in income declines um, for many people. Um, banks at a certain moment might be involved um, because they, 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 they get bad loans on their balance sheet. And, 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 and all this um, makes it necessary for governments to, to try to stop this downward spiral. And we see that governments everywhere are trying to do this by um, financial support to business sector, unemployment compensation, retarding uh, tax uh, revenues and, and social security contributions. And, 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 and also now, and maybe this could come very quickly, uh, the need to support uh, the banking sector if uh, these dominoes continue to fall and, and, and accelerate the deflationary spiral. So this is the, the economic issue that we face now, right? The economic crisis that uh, we face at this moment. Um, and and the, the effect of, of such a crisis is, of course, that uh, it leads to a rapid deterioration of government finances. Um, governments have to, to spend more, have less tax revenue, and debt accumulation now uh, is becoming a, a serious problem. Um, and uh, one of the, the, the problems now within the Eurozone is that um, some, of, some of the countries like Italy and Spain are facing the, the most intense um, problem of deflationary spiral as a result of this epidemic. And, and, but there are also the countries that have the least capacity to deal with it because of their uh, initial uh, unfavorable um, debt situation. This contrasts a great deal with other countries like in particular Germany that is capable at this moment to, to start a, a massive program of budgetary support, which um, these other countries uh, are not able to do at this moment, but may be forced to do it anyway. And, and there was certainly a danger here that uh, the, the purely national response that we see um, will leave a, a permanent legacy, um, especially in the southern European countries where the, the, the intensity of the crisis is uh, the, the greatest, uh, a legacy of unsustainable government debt levels, right? That will condemn these countries to years, if not decades, of austerity, something that they have seen after the financial crisis, and it risks to be repeated in these countries. And such a prospect, I think, will certainly undermine the enthusiasm for the euro, right? And, and I'm, that is really an understatement, especially um, if all this in these countries, in Italy and Spain, is seen as also the result of an unwillingness of Northern European countries to, to help financially, right? The political backlash that we may experience when we are in that situation where we have created unsustainable debt levels in these countries um, is, is really something that will endanger the Eurozone itself. So therefore, I would say it, it's an, it, it will become an existential crisis of, of the Euro if we don't deal with it um, common, in a common way. So how can we solve this? The first best solution, in my view, would be indeed a special issue of your bond, a quite massive issue of your bonds, or call it Corona bonds or whatever, um, which would allow the debt accumulation uh, resulting from the Corona crisis to be spread more fairly over all member countries. Of course, you may say I'm dreaming, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's not very likely that this will be possible because the resistance from a number of Northern European countries um, is, is quite intense. And yesterday I, I listened to this Dutch Minister of Finance and it, this was such a, an incredible thing that I saw there. He was invoking moral hazard. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? Moral hazard. Now it reminds me of a famous statement of Tehran 
when the French aristocrats came back to, to France after the defeat of Napoleon and took over again, right? And Dion said of them, ils n'ont rien appris, ni rien oublié. So when I applied that to this finance minister, he is still thinking. Um, well, he, he, he doesn't really understand, apparently, the nature of the crisis today. He has not learned that we are in a different crisis. And he has not forgotten the old recipes that may have been necessary during the previous financial crisis. It's really terrifying that um, some people um, come out with, with, with such a response and which influence then the whole population. Well, this being said, um, um, let me try to be a little more optimistic. I mean, so I, I don't exclude that we can go for, for a, a EU, common euro bond issue, but um, what I see uh, makes me a little skeptical. And that leads me then to, to the second best approach, right? Uh, how can we deal with it in the second best world where, where we are unable to issue a large um, euro bond? And then I would say, well, um, the ECB uh, should monetize the deficits arising from uh, this corona crisis. Um, you may ask the question, why is this necessary? And Cynthia asked, in fact, the question that I now want to, to deal with, is it not sufficient um, what the ECB has been announcing, namely uh, this pandemic emergency purchase, purchase program of 750 billion, will not, that not deal with the problem? And here, first, I, I want to say, yeah, this is a great step forward. I, I certainly support this initiative, but it only addresses the liquidity problem. Right, that may arise when you have a crisis situation. So the, the ECB is then ready to intervene and buy these sovereign bonds in the uh, secondary market. But it doesn't address the solvency problem that these countries uh, are going to face, uh, which arises from the fact that um, their interventions today um, will face them with a large public debt that will be there as an overhang um, paralyzing their future efforts for recovery. Um, it may also lead to sovereign debt crisis and, and we don't know whether the future ECB, when that happens, will be ready to intervene again. Now today, during the Corona crisis, they are willing to do that. But after that, uh, will the ECB be ready to intervene in the secondary market? And that's why I think a monetary financing is necessary, right? Uh, um, where where the, the essentially the, the ECB would provide um, the liquidity directly to the sovereigns so as to avoid that they have to issue large debt today that will um, constrain their potential policies in, in the future. Now you may say, well, there's a legal issue, right? Uh, it's, it's verboten, it exists verboten. Huh? Um, we are not allowed to do that according to the treaty. Um, that reminds me of a, a famous um, dictum of Cicero, who said, Salus populi suprema lex. Right? In crisis, when we face existential crisis, then it is the health and the welfare of the people that should be the supreme law. And we should then set aside rules that we have imposed on ourselves. And these rules may make sense, and they do make sense under normal conditions, but not when we face existential problems. Then we have to have the cool bloodedness to say, well, these were rules that constrained us in normal times, but they should not constrain us when we are in crisis situations. And I understand that the German government also wants to apply this Cicero uh, maxim when it has set aside the constitutional rule of Schwarzenegger. It has understood that in crisis situations, we should not be bound by rules that we have imposed on ourselves. Then there is something supreme that should guide us and not these rules. Now, of course, I'm aware that uh, this will not uh, satisfy um, everybody. Um, and, and that we may need some clever lawyer to, to solve this problem, right? Some clever European lawyers who will find some ways to deal with it. And, and I think we can do it. I mean, let me give you an example. I don't want to, to sell that as the only way we can do it, but 
governments could issue, national governments could issue a perpetual corona bonds with zero interest rates, right? And dump it on the balance sheet of their domestic banks. And a few days later, the ECB buys these bonds in the secondary market, right? And this would be equivalent, in fact, to a monetary financing. Um, and, and I know, I know the lawyer, so I, I, I don't want to defend that 100%. <laughs> Maybe there are better ways to do it. And, and I really admire the, um, the, the extreme um, creativity of, of many EU lawyers that could guide us there. Let me conclude. Um, I think it's time to set aside um, our dogmas, right? And, and, and to think outside the box. Um, the dogmas that we have to set aside uh, may be appropriate in normal times, but not when we face an existential crisis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I will give the floor directly to, to Daniel, maybe for some reaction and also for giving him the opportunity to share his thoughts. Thanks a lot, Paul. It's always a pleasure to debate with you. Uh, we have been on different sides of the argument for not always, but uh, quite some time in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, let me say, first of all, that I uh, totally agree that this is a uh, special unforeseen extreme situation and uh, I totally agree that in such a situation one might need to put aside uh, old rules even if they're enshrined in treaties. There's actually a German saying which is not can kein Gebot which is more or less the same which you That's right. cited in Latin. Not breakt wet. In Dutch we say not breakt wet. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, when I have some doubts about uh, some of these propositions you, you made, it is not because uh, the treaty doesn't allow it, because uh, I have some doubts about the underlying economic mechanisms. I wanted to make that clear uh, from the very beginning. Now the background to uh, what uh, um, I'm going to say is that we are of course today in an unprecedented situation, uh, which uh, with a a sharp drop in economic activity, this time not resulting in the first instance from a lack of, say, voluntary demand, but because people just don't, can't go to shops and fact, some factories cannot produce. However, every indication are that this will be strictly temporary. And then uh, once uh, the crisis, the health crisis is over, all the productive capacity is there. But of course, and there I totally agree with Paul, we have to uh, avoid, I was going to say almost at all costs, a uh, deflationary spiral, which I would define mainly as having a situation in which many individuals or firms go bankrupt. We have learned from the past that these bankruptcies have very high economic costs, and make it very difficult to restart business, plan new investment and so on. And uh, that's why uh, the central banks all over the world uh, have learned uh, the lesson from the past crisis and they know that if the market requires liquidity they will provide it and uh, in this publication I have made the the comparison between uh, the hoarding of, of toilet paper by everybody which suddenly you can no longer find in the shops and this mad dash for cash everybody wants to have cash because everybody is uncertain now what is happening tomorrow and central banks, I think, should provide that cash, that liquidity, in, by the amount needed. And unfortunately, central banks can create unlimited amounts of liquidity. And therefore, I totally agree in this special situation, central banks have to go all in to prevent a liquidity crisis. Okay. Now, once we have the over the crisis and the economy restarts, uh, then of course, uh, governments, which in the meantime will have had to support business and individuals will um, exit the crisis or will find themselves with a much higher debt level because uh, the costs might be very very large and as paul just said unfortunately uh, this crisis hits the weakest uh, strongest now the question is what do we do in this situation if we just say euro bonds, uh, then uh, the uh, actual debt level of the Italian government, let's say, uh, 
uh, after the crisis has ended would not be any different as if it had financed itself uh, the crisis. Just that the total Italian government debt would have two parts. There would be, if you want, the legacy debt and the new uh, participation of Italy in uh, the, the euro bonds uh, which have been issued. And that means, uh, and, the, and the second point, which is very important, is that presumably these uh, euro bonds would be senior in the sense that the payment obligations of Italy to, uh, or the part of the Italy in the overall um, uh, service of these, these, these bonds uh, would be uh, come before the service on the national debt, which would become junior. And here comes the first economic principle, which is that if the overall debt level is not much different, but part of the overall debt level is, uh, is senior, that means that the rest, as I said, is junior and therefore will cost more, will be more risky and more subject to speculative attacks. And therefore, I have always been rather skeptical about this idea of euro bonds because uh, it doesn't really change the overall debt level and risks uh, making uh, tax on the remaining debt more likely and therefore uh, might make the entire situation actually less stable. Now, so what should one do then? Now, my proposition would be um, very different. I would say that de facto at least it's, it seems that this is an asymmetric crisis. Asymmetric in the sense that the same threat of a uh, of a health crisis uh, has led to very different, actually also actual developments and uh, very different uh, perhaps uh, uh, costs for national governments. And therefore we should activate something which is foreseen in the treaty, Article 122.2, which is that the union should help uh, uh, the, the member countries concerned, which are hit by an uh, asymmetric shock. And I would propose that we should rather think about direct transfers, um, not uh, credits, uh, but direct transfers to the countries uh, hardest hit, which are uh, uh, financed uh, by, uh, by the EU budget. Uh, in this sense, uh, the Italian debt would increase uh, much less. Uh, there would be uh, a concrete sign of the solidarity of the union. And uh, therefore, I would prefer much uh, to recognize that uh, here there is an, a case where some countries might be overburdened and a concrete uh, way to help them is not necessarily to introduce uh, an entirely new instrument, but uh, to provide these countries directly uh, with a uh, uh, I should say a transfer, a gift, uh, something which they do not have uh, to uh, to pay back. I think that should be our our principle. If we have a, a country or a region um, or an enterprise which is has difficulty servicing its debt, uh, then providing them with more cheap credit uh, is perhaps uh, not the best way. So to conclude. Uh, I think all the liquidity operations of the ECB, uh, I think, have my full support and I think everybody's support. That is exactly what is needed right now around the world. But I, I doubt uh, that uh, uh, issuing these uh, Corona bonds uh, would be much help uh, to the countries most stricken by this crisis. Uh, and to repeat, I'm not opposed to them because they are not they're forbidden by the treaty, but uh, because uh, if I look at the economic mechanisms, uh, which we, we all know, I have my doubts that they would be really very useful. Okay, uh, many thanks, Daniel. Paul, would you like briefly to react to, to Daniel before um, I start to, to, to read some of the questions? We have already uh, several of them. Yeah, just a, a few points. I mean, um, if I understand Daniel well, first of all, I know that the skepticism of Eurobonds uh, uh, 
has been has been there for quite some time and has not changed uh, despite uh, the crisis. Um, but on, on the, the proposal that he makes, I'm a little bit surprised uh, how he wants to do that. I mean, I understand that uh, you want direct transfer financed by the EU budget, I understand, yeah. which is 1% of EU GDP. Now, in most countries, we, we, we are facing the prospect where the additional budget deficit may amount to 5 to 10% of GDP. How, for heaven's sake, is that going to make any difference, right? If you want to find within the EU budget, which is peanuts funding of things that are going to amount to hundreds of billions of euros. So you, you really have to make it clear to me how you are going to, to make these transfers that matter possible at all. Um, so that, that's my, my major problem. You have not gone into my, my proposal, which is to use the possibilities of um, the, the ECB in dealing with this issue and to avoid that uh, the solvency problem that these countries are going to face when they have to address um, a permanently higher debt to GDP ratio, that is certainly not going to be taken care of by transfers from the EU budget that are a fraction of 1% of EU GDP. Okay, uh, Daniel, maybe a response, uh, just uh, one sentence, or we'll leave it for later. In a sense, it is a variant of uh, the Eurobonds, but with one very important uh, difference. Uh, you're quite right that it cannot be paid from the current EU budget. But let me just first of all say that uh, if we limit the transfers to those countries which are hardest hit, we don't have to think about 5% uh, of EU GDP, let's say everybody spends it, but uh, only let's say 20, 25% of that amount because it would be mainly for, for Italy and perhaps some of it for Spain. Right? So the amount would be much lower. In a sense, uh, what I'm saying is that if one could have uh, the EU budget guaranteeing a one-time issue of these Corona bonds you were... You were bonds for you, are ah, for you a bonds then. Yes, but I would say that uh, I would not burden Italy with also the uh, having to contribute to the part of the expenditure which will be done in Germany. Of course not. Right? And this is why I think uh, it should be a, a one-time issuance, which would be uh, only to finance uh, additional expenditure in Italy and Spain without therefore burdening Italy with its part of the expenditure in Germany. Of course, I'm actually my own proposal too. So we agree, Daniel. So we agree uh, to issue euro bonds. There's a, there's a difference between issuing euro bonds for, so to speak, everybody. I want in a certain sense, go further and make sure that uh, Italy is not, uh, it basically does not have to pay part of the expenditure of the others. Okay, no problem. Okay, let me start with some questions. So there are already several, there are a few of them uh, on Eurobonds. Maybe I will start on this one since it's, um, uh, it will allow us to keep, uh, um, to continue the, the conversation. So first question, given that not all member uh, countries agree um, on Eurobonds, uh, would it make sense to, or that those who are willing to agree actually um, integrate even further and, and go ahead with Eurobonds? Would that be possible? So this is a, basically the second question that you can see. It's about Eurobonds and the fact that uh, uh, some of, not all countries will agree. What oh, if some, oh yeah. yeah. So for example, those countries, the nine countries that have come up with this proposal where they could not go ahead yep. um, separately. Yeah, of course they could, yeah, in a way they could. Uh, it would, of course, be better to, to involve everybody, huh? but if that's not possible, um, yes, I, I would think so, but uh, I think the ECB then is, is so, so much better place to deal with this problem than a fraction of the, of the countries of the, of the Eurozone. Now, let me just say, I think this, does not really make sense because the weak ones 
they, they might as well issue euro bonds, <laughs> but this is uh, one drowning uh, uh, trying to uh, help himself by uh, whatever grabbing another one. Um, I think uh, we, what is it decisive here? We need the contribution of the fiscally strong. Mm -hmm. No, and, I agree. And I would uh, say that we need an asymmetric contribution of the fiscally strong for this uh, one-time uh, uh, event. And therefore, um, my proposal would be that we recognize the one-time nature of this event, um, the, if you want, exogenous nature. And uh, for these cases, uh, solidarity uh, should have a concrete expression, I repeat, not so much by giving an additional credit, but uh, by uh, making a transfer. There was actually a question exactly um, on, on the point of, of the questions. It's the last question that was asked, uh, Daniel. Um, aren't transfers even less politically acceptable to northern uh, countries than, than euro bonds? Is, it is a euro bond what Daniel is proposing. It is an issue of euro bonds, the proceeds of which would be used to transfer to Italy and Spain. In a and it's a once and for all thing. So, but I mean, I think that the, the question is conceptually, uh, transfers have been uh, always very difficult to accept by some countries. And at the beginning, Daniel said that uh, in fact, what would work best is rather a, a transfer. Uh, rather than euro bonds, but politically, don't you think that is even more difficult to accept? Um, there, actually, I would disagree. Of course, we are all <laughs> individual experts in the political economy, um, because it is uh, one thing uh, to use if you want a generalized, unspecific uh, mechanism, which uh, perform, which is uh, symmetric for everybody. Um, as to say, we recognize the, and, and argue because we actually, Paul said, we are doing it because the situation in, in Italy is, uh, is so, so dire with respect to public finances. Um, and I think the, uh, the Northern European public would understand uh, that here uh, the crisis is de facto very asymmetric and uh, therefore a one-time help would be appropriate. Um, so therefore, um, on the political economy, of course, it's very difficult to say, but uh, let's say for Italy at one time transfer of 5% uh, of GDP, let's say, uh, would be 60 billion. Um, if you add, let's say, Spain and whatever, uh, another 20, 30 billion. Uh, this is something which uh, even an EU budget, let's say, distributed over 20 years, uh, um, could be would be able to bear in terms of uh, repayment obligations, and uh, I think it would have the advantage that for the northern European public, it is clear this is if you want once and for all. It is not a an unlimited guarantee for the public debt, the legacy public debt of Italy. But Daniel, can I? Uh, that, do I understand you well? Because so you are really saying. At the moment, this transfer would be done. The union would issue bonds, right? Call exactly. them union bonds. And the revenue, the, the, the proceeds of this bond issue would then be channeled to Italy and Spain and possibly others related to Corona. So it's, it's a pure euro bond issue that then, of course, the, the union will have to repay over whatever period you, you do it, 10 years or 20 years, right? Exactly. So, okay, that's what you propose, but I'm all in favor of this. This is what most people have in mind when they talk about euro bond issue. At least that's what also, also what I had in mind when I was talking about the euro bond issue. But of course you can call it a transfer, whatever, but it is basically what so many other people have been proposing. As I said, the, the only difference is that Italy does not participate uh, in the in the expended in basically being a guarantor uh, of the expenditure of everybody else. It's it's public debt would be lower. Okay, right? that's right. That's and, the, and the counterpart would be that explicitly 
uh, there is no guarantee if you want for the legacy debt because mm -hmm. the objection or the fears in in northern europe in germany and but not only germany it has always been um, we basically become uh, responsible for the legacy debt and uh, that we don't want uh, but in this special situation there's a special uh, uh, situation i think uh, one should help the country directly mm -hmm. On this, that there was a question on the MFF. So MFF is now under negotiation. So would a rapid adoption of the MFF be a key contribution to solving the crisis? Not a key contribution. <laughs> it could be a very small contribution. If, let's say, my idea of special euro bonds were in there, one could say, let's say there's a one-time contribution, let's say 100 billion, just to make a round number. Um, let's say it is going to be repaid over 20 years. So one would have to earmark in the new MFF uh, 5 billion per year for the amortization of these euro bonds. Um, if one could give that signal, um, I think uh, that would be, would be very, very helpful indeed. And how, there is a question on this, how are these bo um, bonds uh, going to be repaid? Uh, rising taxes? That's what I'm saying is, I mean, it would be via the, the European budget. Um, every, every country participates with 1% of its GDP, roughly speaking, or 1.2 or whatever, right? And uh, there, would have this, there would have been less EU expenditure on other things, maybe the CAP, <laughs> maybe regional funds. And uh, as I outlined earlier, um, the magnitude uh, would be relatively contained. One wouldn't have to really slash EU expenditure overall. I think a, a, modest, uh, a modest cut in some of these things which economists have always said are not really useful at an EU level uh, would be sufficient to make room over 20 years for the full amortization, um, which I think uh, in, the, in the long term is, uh, is important. Um, a follow-up question. Um, how would you explain the benefits of such euro bonds to German taxpayers? Well, as I said, I mean, this is uh, the expression of the EU solidarity, which uh, I say, okay, legally it's in the treaty. Politically, it is part of the, uh, of the, re of the fact that Germany and, and all other countries are in a union in which uh, basically we should help everybody, each other in special situations. And here I, I concur with Paul also that uh, we need to have also a sign that uh, um, Italy will not be totally left alone. And uh, I think the way to explain it to the German public is to say is, we understand that uh, you don't want to be responsible for the legacy debt in Italy. Um, but uh, I think the German public will also understand that uh, um, uh, the, the German, Germany itself uh, has uh, draws a very large uh, benefits from being in the EU, uh, both economically and politically. And uh, that uh, sending this signal of concrete support for a country which uh, was already overburdened, perhaps of its own fault, but still it was, uh, that uh, this would actually benefit Germany in the long term. And uh, honestly, the burden for Germany would not be that large. Then I have two questions, so, which are exactly going in, in the same direction. It is about the difference between issuing euro bonds uh, and uh, um, accumulating national bonds uh, on the ECB balance sheet. I mean, economically, aren't they the same? And in particular, while for euro bonds, you would need to, to change the treaty, uh, the ECB no. in principle can buy even a larger amount of bonds and possibly with uh, uh, more for the countries where the debt is high. Um, okay, on my euro bonds, again, I'm, I, the, my idea would not be, I don't think you need to change the treaty because as I said, it would be just one-time expenditure of the EU, right? Which is, which is different uh, from saying we create a new instrument where everybody is, uh, is responsible. Um, 
um, pro, 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 pro rata, and then it can be spent by, by everybody. Um, let me just uh, say one thing. Um, Paul knows that uh, I have always been very skeptical about the acquisition of national bonds uh, by the uh, quote unquote ECB. Uh, because the PSPP uh, means uh, that it is not the ECB which is buying the national bonds, but it is the Banca d'Italia, which buys uh, Italian government bonds, the Bundesbank, uh, which buys uh, German government bonds, without risk sharing. And that means actually that if in future, not today, but if in future, uh, there was a doubt about the possibility of Italy not repaying, uh, then uh, market participants uh, would know that uh, here for them, uh, the burden might become uh, more important. Um, this is, I'm talking about an economic mechanisms, not uh, now, now politically. It would of course be different, and I presume this is what Paul had in mind, if the ECB were to buy uh, these bonds, but really with full risk sharing, right? That is the key issue here. Well, um, first, I would prefer that this um, could be done, that the ECB buys this, and it's, uh, um, it's, it's, it's on the balance sheet of the Euro system, right? And, and it's fully shared. But in fact, it doesn't make a difference. I mean, um, if, say, take the Banca d'Italia where to buy um, Italian bonds and put it on its balance sheet, right, and, and issue uh, money base as a counterpart. Right? That, that's essentially what would happen there. Um, in 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 the economic sense, these bonds cease to exist. Right? I mean, the, they they could actually be put into a shredding machine. The old-fashioned bonds, when they were still paper bonds, right? You could actually put them in the shredding machine. It wouldn't make any difference because all that happens is that uh, when these Italian bonds are on the balance sheet of the Banca d'Italia. Um, the, UK, the Italian Treasury pays interest to the Banca d'Italia and the Banca d'Italia returns it to the Treasury. They could as well stop this uh, comedy and put it off the balance sheet. So it doesn't make difference. The, the, the bonds can be disposed of. Right? They have no economic meaning anymore because it's an interagency um, loan, so to say, and you, if you consolidate uh, the public sector, it, it disappears. So it doesn't really make a difference. But of course, people don't understand this. That, that is the problem. Uh, people may not understand this, that these bonds actually cease to exist in an economic sense. And, and therefore, uh, we may have to educate uh, even market participants who, who think that um, these bonds on the balance sheet of the central bank still exist in an economic sense. So basically, that what would happen is that the uh, the, the Euro system or the Banca d'Italia is one agent in the Euro system would actually monetize um, the, the debt. And, and that's, that's what would happen. And, and no more, no less. And the debt burden of Italy, um, so the, the legacy problem of the Italian government would disappear. And on this point, we fundamentally disagree. Um, I think the key point here is risk sharing or not. If there's no risk sharing, right? And I'm talking about this situation. Uh, then uh, I think there's one key point which the analysis of Paul does not take into account. It's totally true that these uh, these bonds, uh, which the bank, these Italian government bonds, which the Banca d'Italia has on its balance sheets, become irrelevant. What is not irrelevant is the fact that the Banca d'Italia then has liabilities towards the public towards the banking system. And uh, as long as, of course, as long as we have a situation with uh, negative interest rates, uh, that de facto uh, might be a very comfortable situation. But uh, this situation will not last forever, right? Uh, sooner or later, or when we have a normalization of, uh, of, uh, of interest rates, uh, then uh, the uh, the Banca d'Italia, as any other bank uh, in, the, in Europe, will have to pay. So what the acquisition of uh, the bonds uh, by the Banca d'Italia does, is does, it does not reduce net public debt. It, redu it changes its form. Italian public debt, instead of being uh, um, uh, in the form of uh, long-term bonds, uh, 
becomes a liability is the is partially uh, the liabilities of the Banca d'Italia towards either the rest of the zero uh, the euro the euro the euro system excuse me via target liabilities or directly via uh, via via bank deposits of Italian banks uh, at the Banca d'Italia public debt as such does not change that's quite clear. The Banca Italia is a subsidiary of the Treasury. If you just have a, uh, a, uh, a financial uh, transaction between the subsidiary and the, the mother company, so to speak, that doesn't uh, change the entire debt obligations of uh, the conglomerate. No, I disagree, Daniel. But you have in mind that uh, the Banca d'Italia um, pays interest on its liabilities. It doesn't have to do that. There's no reason why the central bank has to pay interest. It doesn't do on the banknotes. Huh? If, if the money base takes the form of banknotes, it doesn't pay interest. It doesn't have to pay interest on the reserves banks hold at the Banca d'Italia. It has been doing this for some reason in the past. Um, the, the central banks have started paying interest on the reserves of the, that the banks hold at the, at the central bank, but there's no reason to do that. In the far away past, no central bank actually did that. We have changed that under pressure of the banking system. The banking system has been pushing central banks to pay interest on their reserves, and there's absolutely no need to do that. And as a result, what would happen if the Banca d'Italia were to buy these uh, treasury bills, uh, these uh, government bonds, it would transform an interest-bearing debt into a monetary liability with zero interest rate, which of course could create inflation. That's another thing. So it may create inflation if that is your point, but it certainly does not necessitate the Banca d'Italia to pay interest on these liabilities. Whether or not the Banca d'Italia has to pay interest on these liabilities, uh, that is a decision which is taken in Frankfurt. That's right. And that could right? change the decision. And if Frankfurt uh, changes its decision, uh, then they will have to pay interest. And the point is, of course, uh, we have now central banks with huge balance sheets. And under present circumstances, commercial banks in the aggregate are willing to hold huge amounts of excess reserves. If and when commercial banks start to withdraw these reserves, then, as you very well said, then at the euro area aggregate level, there might be danger of inflation. Well, I, I welcome the danger of inflation, Daniel, because okay. now we face, we face deflation, right? Uh, okay. if, we can, if we can have some inflation, that would be good news. That's okay, great. sorry, to, I need to interrupt you because we have a, a very long list of, of questions and I would like to go back to, to the topic of, uh, of the day. There are actually a few questions about the potential role of the ESM. Uh, so ESM uh, is, is there, it has uh, quite some resources and actually there was a proposal a few days ago by some economists uh, also to uh, design a special credit line. So one of the question um, we received is, uh, uh, could the ESM and uh, some special credit line complement the monetary policy, uh, monetary policy initiative of the ECB? How can be done and what kind of features this uh, credit line should have? Paul, do you want to go first? Uh, well, um, you know, I'm not a, a great fan of the ESM. Uh, it's there. We might as well use it. Um, so I, I don't see why it could not provide some credit um, in, in times of crisis. Um, and I understand that the ECB could also support this. Um, so essentially the ESM, if I understand it well, is, is actually also issuing bonds, right? That you could call Euro bonds um, and that could be used for good purposes. Um, I, I don't think it should be used in conjunction with uh, conditionality. Um, so if, if uh, the, the credit lines that the um, ESM is providing are associated with uh, conditionality of the type that we have seen in the past, then I don't think this would be a good, good vehicle to be used uh, to support uh, countries that are hit by the corona crisis. Daniel? I'm skeptical about the use of the ESM. It's one thing if you have a country uh, which needs uh, 
liquidity, especially if it needs liquidity from abroad, uh, then uh, it is useful to give that country a credit, maybe an emergency credit. Uh, but here, I repeat, uh, we have a country which is probably either already at the limit of being over-indebted and giving more credits is not, it's not maybe the solution uh, to the problem. No, I agree. The second point is that uh, you see the ESM uh, is basically made for the case when a country has difficulty refining itself from abroad. That was the case in Greece to some extent and others. Or if the foreign creditors suddenly start a run. This is not the case. Italy has actually a current account surplus. Uh, it's likely to continue to have one. And this means uh, that actually there's enough Italian savings available in a fl in flow uh, consideration to finance the Italian government uh, deficit. And uh, as long as the Italians themselves maintain the confidence uh, in the ability of the Italian government to repay its debt even after the corona crisis, uh, then uh, there should be uh, no problem. Uh, the key qu question is actually, um, should the ESM lend uh, to Italy, to the Italian government, when the Italian uh, taxpayers themselves uh, don't want to do that? Um, th there is uh, also, uh, I mean, following up on this, there is, there is one question where basically says that, uh, okay, we have gone through different options, Eurobond, monetization of debt, transfers, ESM. In the end, I mean, since we need some intervention quite rapidly, what is the most likely uh, policy decisions to, to be taken in, in this sense? What should we expect? Um, yeah, well, uh, I hate to make predictions. <laughs> I mean, it's so difficult, as you know, this saying it, forecasting is so difficult, especially when you want to forecast the future. Um, but um, yeah, so much politics is going to be involved in this. And we know what should be done. I think uh, there is some consensus between Daniel and me, at least about uh, the part of Eurobond um, issue. Um, not about what the ECB should do. Um, and so we, we, we know what should be done, um, but I really don't know what these politicians are going to come out with. Um, I, I hate to make a, a prediction there. I, I, I do think that something will come out, uh, but it's going to be something um, complex, um, limited, um, and, and therefore also insufficient, I think, uh, to deal with, with the problem um, because so much resistance still continues to exist. Um, so that's all I can say about what my own forecast is going to be about uh, the decisions of, of uh, European policymakers. On the last point, I, I agree with Paul, but I think the ESM solution is at least for policymaker, looks uh, the easiest uh, mm. procedurally and, and politically. And uh, therefore, I think we will see uh, some uh, ESM uh, program. But uh, I think the key question then is, uh, uh, once the health part has been uh, subdued, um, how are countries dealing with the crisis and the legacy? Mm -hmm. Do they change? Will we have, so to speak, a new Italy post-corona, or will politics uh, continue as before? And I think that is uh, the key question, which uh, uh, we cannot really, uh, well, let's say, the result of which uh, we cannot really steer from the, at the European level. This will be uh, decisively determined by how local politics plays out in member countries. And uh, therefore, I think what we need, and here I agree with Paul, we need a strong signal from the EU that uh, we are providing some help. And uh, that help should become, should come as quickly as possible. Uh, but uh, it should be clearly linked uh, to this specific crisis. Mm -hmm.
Um, then there were a few questions um, uh, referring to the to the article of uh, Mario Draghi, the, the former president of the ECB, it was published yesterday in, in the Financial Times. And uh, one of the key points is that uh, uh, public debt will be higher and uh, much higher, and we we'll have to to learn to to live with it. And here that a uh, few questions. Uh, um, the one related to this. First of all. How, what kind of debt increase, more or less, should we expect, if we have any idea? Um, uh, the, the second thing is, uh, what will happen with this debt once we are out of the crisis? Well, again, um, people ask us to make forecasts, and <laughs> that's uh, quite difficult. Huh? I mean, um, I, I generally refuse to make forecasts also because we, we really don't know how this pandemic is going to evolve, right? The key thing is how long will this last? How deep will it go in terms of um, immobilizing people and therefore also making production impossible? Um, all these things today, um, we, we, we don't understand, we don't know. The, the, the virologists and the immunologists don't know then and how can we possibly uh, make a forecast we can only maybe have some scenarios and, and and the worst scenario one could develop the worst scenarios that would involve uh, major declines that uh, we have not seen since the great depression you know, uh, with with uh, large budget deficits and, and huge legacy of debt i hope it doesn't come to that uh, and, and we certainly can, can help to, to mitigate all this, but uh, there are a whole panoply of, of possible outcomes that we still don't know about. Um, in any case, we have to, the key point that um, I guess Daniel and, and I are in agreement with is that we should organize at the European level some mechanism of support, of solidarity, because Otherwise, the, the Eurozone is in, in danger. I mean, afterwards, if we fail to do so, and if this crisis becomes so deep and, and destructive, um, then um, in the countries that have suffered most, the, the, the political um, backlash, the, the, the resentment against those who have failed to come to, to help will be overwhelming. And we should expect an under this worst scenario outcome that the Eurozone will blow up. So we have to avoid this. We can avoid this by organizing um, support. And, and as Daniel said, convince, for example, in Germany and the Netherlands that it's in their own interest to do so, right? To, to preserve something that has been good for them. Right? In my view, the war analogy is uh, not useful because war brings it with it a um, huge destruction. Um, whereas here, uh, in this case, nothing really uh, will be uh, destroyed. Um, and as long as we can keep liquidity flowing uh, during the acute phase of financial market up upheaval, uh, then uh, the economy should be ready to restart uh, once governments basically take the uh, <clears throat> take away the the lockdown, um, and then we might be left with somewhat higher debt levels. But um, overall, I think uh, that should not be uh, uh, so uh, so much more that it changes entirely the situation. Let's take if we take Germany, uh, if it's another ten percent of GDP more, um, that is not doesn't really change uh, the situation in Germany, Netherlands, or some other, most other parts of Europe, except for those countries which were already at the borderline uh, uh, beforehand. And if I make uh, one observation, this crisis shows once more that uh, uh, the idea that uh, you keep your debt levels low to be prepared for emergencies is maybe not so bad after all. Now it's of course too late, but uh, I think once the crisis is over, once the economy restarts, uh, then we should perhaps uh, think about uh, this fact as well. <laughs>
Okay, we have reached uh, three uh, o'clock, so it is uh, the, the time to close this uh, this webinar. Let me just say that uh, we have gone through uh, a number of, of policy options uh, um, which are, um, are there. Uh, there is some skepticism on both, both from Daniel and Paul side about uh, to what extent they will be uh, actually uh, implemented, but uh, um, it's not that we are without a response. Um, I still have a number of questions which will remain uh, unanswered. Uh, I apologize for those who have asked. Uh, I invite everyone who is still in, uh, uh, on the line to um, contact us in case you want any clarification and of course to keep following us with uh, the next uh, uh, webinars. Uh, good afternoon to everyone and uh, many thanks to all. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. See you, Cynthia. You did bye. Well. Bye, Paul. Ciao, Daniel. Bye bye, Daniel. Enjoy California. Yeah, no.